My name is Loretta Lowe. I am the convener of today's um, SciTech Asia seminar, the first one in 2022. So welcome. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. James Wright. So Dr. Wright is a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute, which is a UK's uh, a new national institute for data science and AI in the UK. So Dr. Wright received his PhD in anthropology and also in science and technology studies, STS, at the University of Hong Kong in 2018. His research interests include the development and the use of robots, artificial intelligence, and other digital technologies uh, for elderly care specifically. And he's currently working on a project called Path AI, which focuses on AI ethics and governance in both the UK and Japan. So today's uh, Dr. Wright is going to give us a talk about robot and whether or not it is a solution to Japan's care crisis. So without further ado, I will pass the stage to James. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Loretta. And uh, thanks to, to you, Gonzalo and Yi Chen for um, organizing this fantastic um, webinar series. Um, so I'm going to, I have two screens, so I'm not gonna look directly at the camera. Um, so apologies for that. Um, so the talk that I'm gonna give today is based on aspects of my PhD um, that I completed actually under Gonzalo's um, excellent supervision at Hong Kong U. Um, and it also draws on my upcoming uh, book with Cornell University Press, which is hopefully going to be um, published later this year. So today I'm gonna to talk about robots that are being developed and used primarily in the context of residential elder care in Japan. Um, but I hope that the relevance extends beyond the specific case of Japan to other countries that are looking to robots as a possible solution uh, to their care crises. Um, in recent years, there's been an explosion of interest in the application of robots to care, um, obviously from the fields of robotics and uh, human-robot interaction, but also from science and technology studies um, anthropology, philosophy, and also the emerging field of socio garon technology, um, among others. Um, and there's also been growing interest from news and entertainment media. Um, robots have been uh, presented as a technological solution to the so-called problems presented by aging populations in the global north, and above all to the problems of care gaps caused by the increase in care needs and lack of sufficient numbers of caregivers. The analysis that I'm gonna present uh, is grounded in empirical data that I collected during ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted in Japan, uh, mainly between 2016 and 2018. Um, but I also want to step back and consider some broader questions. Um, what kind of solution to care crises are robots? What would a future with care robots require? Um, and what alternative visions for the future of care might surface through the very process of roboticization. So firstly, I want to define exactly what I mean by care robots or robots used in the care of older adults. Um, so um, my PhD research focused on a particular project which was the Ministry of the Economy, Trade and Industry, or METI's um, project for the development and promotion uh, of the introduction of robot care devices, quite a mouthful, but it was the uh, a 2013 to 2017 project, major project um, that supported the development uh, and implementation of eight different categories of care robots initially. Um, so these are um, illustrations uh, from the project of those eight categories. Um, they included uh, monitoring systems that used cameras and sensors to automatically detect, for instance, if somebody uh, got out of bed at night unexpectedly um, or falls over when they're alone um, and alerts a caregiver. Um, there are also uh, wearable transfer aids um, which can be worn by a caregiver to help them lift a care recipient 
into and out of their bed or wheelchair. Um, there's also non-wearable transfer aids, uh, which can include devices like robotic arms uh, to lift um, uh, uh, a care recipient. Um, also indoor and outdoor mobility aids, um, and also toilet and bathing aids. Um, and in 2016, a ninth category of communication robots was added, and that included devices such as the seal-shaped robot Paro, um, SoftBank Robotics Humanoid Pepper, um, and other so-called social or socially assistive robots. Um, so this major project, um, which was actually, it is the largest single robot care project in the world to date in terms of the, the amount of the investment, um, was led by the National Institute for Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, ICE. Um, and part of my field work in Japan involved spending three months with the team at ICE that was administering the project, which I'll come back to later. So why is Japan trying to develop and implement these kinds of robots? Um, I mean, the answer might seem blindingly obvious. Um, if you've seen any presentation on care robots, you'll almost certainly have seen a variation of the following slides. Um, so this is a very busy graph, but um, essentially what it's showing is that the overall population of Japan, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, um, but the population of Japan um, has peaked. It's been growing through the 20th century. Now it's peaked um, in around 2010 and it started to uh, shrink. At the same time, um, what this graph also shows is that the proportion of older people is growing and the proportion of younger people is shrinking. Um, this, I don't know if you can see that. Um, this chart uh, shows the, um, the number of older people, older adults requiring care has increased um, from 2000. It's almost tripled for between 2000 and 2019. And at the same, over the same time period, the number of care workers has almost quadrupled from half a million to 2.11 million. Uh, and finally, we can, uh, we can have this estimated shortfall of care workers. Um, these are estimates of, of apparent estimates of uh, deficits in 2023, 2025, and 2040. Um, and here we can see a widening gap where the deficit of, of care workers appears to be increasing over time. Um, other charts are often deployed to demonstrate the care crisis, um, such as uh, the rising cost in yen of uh, care provision, uh, the rising percentage of total employment that's taken up by care workers, um, and also the rise in dementia, which is predicted to affect 9 million people, or 10% of Japan's total population by 2050. So together, these and similar graphs frame many people's understanding of Japan's care crisis. Um, in fact, it almost acts as a model care crisis for much of the rest of the global north. Japan is often presented almost proudly, um, actually almost as a national identity, as either the oldest country in the world or the fastest aging country in the world, or both. Um, although depending on how you look at it, actually neither of those claims are necessarily true. Um, when I checked last year, for instance, Monaco had an older median age, uh, South Korea had a fastest aging population, and Hong Kong had a longer life expectancy. Japan certainly has one of the oldest national population groups, but it's interesting that this claim of being the oldest is so frequently repeated and it's become such a powerful framing for Japanese politics and indeed for the claimed need for care robots. The narrative um, presented alongside these kind of uh, graphs is fairly straightforward. The population is projected to age as life expectancy has increased and the total fertility rate remains well below uh, replacement levels. As the population ages, more people require more care. There are fewer young people to provide that care. So care workers are naturally in short supply um, and you need something to fill the resulting care gap. Um, a seemingly natural and rather econometric uh, relationship is posited between demographic aging 
growing demand for care and a lack of available human care. And by implication, uh, the need for and solution of non-human care uh, in the form of technological innovation. And in the case of Japan in particular, the form that this technological innovation should take is often presented as naturally robots based on generalizing and often uncritical assertions of Japanese people's supposed acceptance of robots, which in turn are often based on the invented tradition of Japan's robotic culture, vague assertions of an inherently techno-animist belief system, and the popular imaginary of Japan as already being a futuristic robotic society. These are ideas and images bolstered by the relentless media, corporate and state promotion of robots, supported not just by uh, technology and robotics companies themselves, uh, but also by highly influential advertising giants like Dentsu, uh, one of the largest advertising uh, agencies in the world, which set up a robot promotion center in 2014. Throughout the 2010s, uh, during my uh, field work, there were significant amounts of TV programming across news, entertainment and advertising featuring social robots, including in care related roles. Um, it's therefore something of an inconvenient truth for this narrative that in actual fact, robots don't really feature in most people's daily lives or indeed in elder care in Japan. Uh, the Care Work Stabilization Center survey um, of over 9,000 elder care institutions in Japan showed that in 2019, only about 10% of care homes reported having introduced any care robot. So I want to trouble the seemingly straightforward logical synthesis presented in these kinds of slides, which are so often marshaled to provide a common sense rationale and indeed a business case for the development and use of robots in the care of older adults, particularly in, in the case of Japan, most egregiously. Um, but you also see this in South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, in Europe and the UK as well. Um, is very much presented as a kind of logical slam dunk uh, that's unquestionable and doesn't require further explanation. Um, including these charts in presentations about care robots is an established ritual, but firstly, it's important to ensure that we're actually reading them correctly. So, for example, um, this slide, uh, the lack of care workers slide is often um, provided as prima facie evidence of Japan's impending care worker shortage. It's important to note, uh, to point out the context for this though, um, which is that this is an exercise conducted by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, whereby each prefecture in Japan provides estimates of the care workforce they expect to need in the future versus the number of care workers um, they'd have if nothing changed from the current scenario. And then the ministry's updated uh, long-term plan in theory takes account of this estimated care worker shortfall and takes steps to address it, um, whether that proves ultimately successful or not. So the lower number here is what prefectures say will happen if no action is taken. Um, it's not an estimate of what the actual situation will be in that year. And that's a significant difference and we can see this because this 2025 figure um, was originally estimated at 380,000 in 2017. It was revised down to 337,000 in 2018. And now it's been revised down to 225,000 in their 2021 estimate and all pretty well without the help of robots. Secondly, um, uh, those using these charts often don't explain the deeper political roots of the current care crisis. Um, so um, most notable um, has been the huge impact of the long-term care insurance system, LTCI, which was introduced in 2000 um, and which socialized the cost of elder care in part via a new tax for people aged over 40. And that helps um, explain this seemingly um, astronomic rise in care needs and employment since 2000, which we've seen in this graph. 
Um, as Yamato Reiko has noted, far from being rooted in a static culture of Confucian familism, expectations of care, mutual reliance between older Japanese people and their children has decreased as government welfare provision has increased. And LTCI in particular has played a, a major role in flipping the publicly perceived responsibility for care provision for older people from being mainly the responsibility of the family to being the responsibility of the state. Um, and this had huge implications for care work that help explain the rapid increases in this chart. Um, LTCI introduced an assessment of formal care needs. So in fact, the more accurate label here should be the number of older adults formally assessed under LTCI as requiring care. Um, it also led to the rapid rise in the demand for care workers to address these needs, um, but also arguably a relative reduction in informal care provision by family and friends, um, particularly as more women have moved into work. Um, over this period of time from 2000, the female labour force participation rate has been steadily increasing. Um, and at the same time, there's also been an increase in the proportion of older people living by themselves. Um, despite in, in very recent years, some attempts by the government to try and re-familize care as funding for LTCI has begun to stall. Part of the aim of LTCI was to free up uh, female informal carers um, so that instead of caring for their relatives at home, they'd be able to participate in the formal economy where their labor would become productive and accounted in GDP. But while the number of um, formal care workers, as we can see, um, has risen continuously since 2000, it hasn't been enough to offset the ongoing rise in care needs, leading to growing pressure on the care system. Um, so that's LTCI. Another important uh, element that's missing from these graphs and this narrative is the rapidly evolving migration situation. Um, the total number of foreign workers in Japan doubled from just over half a million in 2009 to a million in 2016 and rose further to 1.66 million by 2019. Um, in recent years, there's been a significant and almost desperate mm -hmm. deregulation of migration channels by the Japanese government, um, including the introduction of a new specified skills uh, work visa program that had the target of bringing 345,000 additional workers from China and Southeast Asia to Japan by 2025. Um, and this was supposed to include 60,000 care workers. Although in the end, I mean, the target hasn't come close to being met, partly initially due to ineffective implementation, and more recently, obviously, uh, with the closure of borders during COVID-19. Um, and then there are other relative, um, relevant things that are missing in these charts. Um, most significantly, the poor paying conditions of care work, which is typically paid around minimum wage level. Um, and Glenda Roberts and Hiroko uh, Costantini's recent work has looked at the introduction of new care work reconciliation policies to try and reduce the number of people dropping out of work in order to care for a family member, um, although these have had very limited impact so far. So all of this is to suggest that the care crisis in Japan is much more complex and dynamic than these kind of charts alone might suggest. And it's certainly not as simple as being the natural consequence of demographic aging or a demographic lack of young people. Because, for example, if care work was better paid and respected, more people would likely become care workers. Um, or if there were more effective policies in place to support informal carers, there'd likely be less demand on formal care services. The care crisis in Japan, like care crises in other countries, isn't a natural or inevitable phenomenon, as is sometimes implicitly presented in crisis narratives that are used to try and push care robot solutions. Instead, it's the result of a series of specific political and economic choices um, many of which, in the case of Japan, as elsewhere, have been informed by a mixture of productivist and neoliberal ideologies. Um, and of course, by extension, the solution of robots or technology to fill care gaps is by no means inevitable. So in this sense, this isn't simply a crisis of care, but a crisis of the way that neoliberal capitalism functions. 
And we start to see here the outlines of what Nancy Fraser has described as a contradiction of capitalism. The idea that capitalism, quote, tends to destabilize the very processes of social reproduction on which it relies, end quote. Crises of care occur as the tacit economic need for unpaid care labor conflicts with the competing drive for maximal employment in the formal labor force. Capitalist models that largely ignore care labor therefore start to look increasingly precarious when reproduction rates fall and a relatively large section of the population passes retirement age, as in the case of Japan. But at the same time, if you try and reconcile this conflict, and move this huge field of neglected informal care labor that you'd been taking for granted into the formal economy is not really possible because it costs so much. Um, I mean, these you know, 2 million care workers are really the tip of the iceberg because they're far outnumbered by informal carers. In some sense, uh, therefore, care robots are presented as the solution, not just to care crises, but also to this wider contradiction of capital, capitalism. Um, they represent an entirely commodified digital and mechanical replacement for large swathes of human care that can act as a bridge between productive and reproductive labor, turning elder care into a productive enterprise, um, or as Nolan and Amanda Sharkey have put it, creating, quote, an elder care factory, end quote. Um, and I use the word replacement, replacement for human care deliberately. Um, this is really a really important inference that tends to be implicitly drawn by these, um, from these charts by people who use them to promote or explain the need for care robots, although they might you know, explicitly deny it. Um, but replacement is an obvious conclusion to draw from the expectation that robots will solve the care worker shortage, because how could that be accomplished without replacing the need for human care workers? Some people reiterate this, um, that robots are intended to supplement, never replace caregivers, for example, um, saying that robots don't do jobs, they do tasks. That's quite a common refrain. But I find this somewhat disingenuous when jobs are thought of uh, increasingly primarily in a Taylorist frame as a conglomeration of discrete tasks, as they are in robotics research, precisely in order to build the business case for robots. What that entails is that by doing enough tasks, robots will also do jobs, although whether this is actually desirable or indeed possible um, in the case of care is a question I'll return to later. Um, during my uh, field work with robot engineers at ICE, I observed how this breaking down of the work of care into individual discrete tasks formed an inherent basis of, on the one hand, the development of robots themselves, and on the other, uh, the creation of a business case for implementation. Um, and the development of care robots relied on what I call a perspective of algorithmic care. Um, in other words, viewing care algorithmically as a linear sequence of simple, repeatable and discrete um, physical and verbal tasks that can be digitally and mechanically reproduced by robots. Um, the people who uh, state that robots do tasks, not jobs, um, often also state that robots can free care workers from dull, repetitive and dangerous physical tasks and focus on more human tasks like social interaction and companionship. But on the one hand, social robots are being developed and implemented precisely in order to provide social interaction and companionship. Um, and on the other, the economic rationale for these robots is centered on reducing the overall cost of care. So as scholars such as Robert and Linda Sparrow and Jennifer Trant have noted, um, it's highly unlikely that care staff would continue to be paid simply in order to provide social interactions and companionship, especially when these interactions are often the first thing to be sacrificed in current care practice in many busy care homes. Why would we expect that to be any different in the future if care homes are spending their shrinking budgets on expensive care robots? We also find other scholars, a minority, 
um, particularly from philosophy and computer science, who attempt to provide philosophical underpinnings for the potential robotic replacement of human caregivers. For example, um, Darian Meacham and Matthew Studley uh, draw on in an activist phenomenological approach to argue that users' perceptions of the care they receive are the only thing that really matters and that therefore care isn't dependent on a caring attitude or any kind of inner state on the part of the caregiver, but just on how well a caregiving agent provides the appearance of empathy and a caring attitude and helps produce a caring environment. And they therefore argue that since you don't require an inner state, that it's therefore equally um, morally acceptable for a robot to provide care as for humans to do so. But what these kind of theoretical positions don't tend to take into account are the material realities, practices, affordances, political economy or environmental impacts of care robots as they exist today and as they're likely to exist in the near future. Um, and they also don't really engage closely with the lived experiences, both of um, those being cared for and those doing the work of care. Um, and I think this is very much um, part of the unique contribution that anthropological research can make. Um, and that's what I'll turn to now. So after spending um, time uh, with the robotics team at IST, I conducted fieldwork at a publicly funded residential elder care facility um, at Tokubetsu Yogo Rojin Homo, or Tokuyo. Um, which is kind of uh, a common kind of elder care facility. Um, I'm going to call uh, this one Sakura, um, which was in Kanagawa, Japan. Um, and they were introducing three different types of care robots in 2017 on a trial basis. Um, I spent around seven months there, both before, during and after uh, the implementation of these robots, um, talking to staff and residents, um, observing what care looked like before the robots were introduced and how it changed when they were actually brought in and used. <clears throat> Together with the facilities manager, um, we decided on three different types of off-the-shelf commercially available care robots um, that were in some way uh, involved in ICE's robot care project, so bringing together the two halves of my ethnographic research. And the three robots uh, that we were decided on were uh, this hug um, lifting robot, um, Paro, which you may have heard of before. Um, it's this seal, uh, robotic seal. Um, and Pepper, uh, which is this humanoid uh, robot from SoftBank, which has actually now been discontinued. Um, so each robot was uh, borrowed for a trial period of around six weeks. Um, and subsequently returned to the companies that lent them out to us. Uh, and during this time, I also carried out surveys and semi-structured interviews with um, almost all of the staff, uh, the care staff. Um, Sakura was, was very typical of that kind of um, elder care facility in terms of size with around 80 residents and 37 care workers. So how were these robots actually used? Um, Obviously, because of time constraints, I'm going to run through this very quickly, but I'm happy to, to talk about it in more detail in the Q&A. Um, so firstly, um, hug. Um, as in many care homes in Japan, um, care staff at Sakura often manually lift residents with disabilities between bed and wheelchair, wheelchair and toilet and so on. And most of them suffer from back pain as a result. Um, you can see that actually this, this care worker on the left is wearing um, this uh, kind of belt. Um, he'd suffered a slip disc as a result of, of working at Sakura, and this was intended to help uh, kind of support him when he did lifting. Um, so hug was intended to avoid uh, the need for manual lifting. Um, the care worker just had to position the resident on the machine, um, as shown here, and then press a button to lift them up off their wheelchair. Then you could wheel around the hug to wherever you wanted to um, put the person down and press another button to, to lower them. But in actual 
use, Hug was quickly sidelined by staff um, who said they found it cumbersome and time consuming to wheel it from room to room. Um, and they said that only a small number of residents could be lifted comfortably using the hug. It also meant that care workers had less physical contact with residents, um, which was valued as an important element of caring with one's own hands. Paddle, the seal robot, was given to residents to play with and keep them occupied as a robotic form of animal therapy and a distraction aid for some people with dementia who made repeated demands of stuff throughout the day. Um, Paddle doesn't speak, um, but it can make noises, move its head and wiggle its tail in response to being petted or talked to. Um, although care workers were initially quite happy with Paddle, um, problems soon emerged as one resident kept trying to um, skin paddle, remove its fur to get to the mechanism underneath. Um, another resident said she was scared of paddle and a third developed a very close relationship with paddle to the point where she refused to eat meals without it beside her. So staff ended up having to keep a very close eye on paddle's interactions with residents. And it also didn't appear to reduce the uh, repetitious demands of those with severe dementia. So finally, Pepper um, was used to conduct recreation sessions that were held normally every afternoon by one of the care workers on shift. Um, so instead of what happened normally, which was a care worker would stand at the front of the room and decide on an activity to do with residents, um, a Pepper, so Pepper would be wheeled to the front and a recreation um, exercise app was used that always followed a set format. Um, so first, actually, the care worker would spend uh, several minutes booting up Pepper, wheeling it to the front of the room, introducing it, and it would then start off uh, playing some upbeat music and then launch into a gentle exercise routine that residents could follow along. But care workers quickly realised that in order to really get residents engaged in the exercise routine with Pepper, they had to stand next to Pepper, copy its movements and echo its instructions. After some time, they did start to get bored with the same routines being performed by Pepper every day, um, and they ended up using Pepper less often. Um, so as I said, um, this is obviously a very brief um, summary and there's a lot to talk about, um, but I want to focus on just a few uh, findings relevant to my overall argument. So firstly, the use of the robots at Sakura didn't save labor. On the contrary, it increased the number of tasks for care workers. Um, robots had to be moved around, maintained, cleaned, booted up, operated, repeatedly explained or introduced to residents usually, um, constantly monitored during use um, and stored away afterwards. And there's a growing body of evidence, so I've listed a few here, um, uh, from of other care robot studies that show that, you know, they tend to increase the number of tasks for care workers. Secondly, um, the use of robots had the potential to de-skill human care tasks at the care home. For example, um, whereas previously care workers came up with their own recreational activities and interacted with residents kind of relatively spontaneously, now they just had to copy Pepper's actions, physical actions, and echo its words. Whereas previously, care staff would chat and socially interact with residents. Now they could just give them paddle to play with and monitor the interaction from a distance. Whereas previously, they'd use body mechanics techniques to lift residents and use the interaction to communicate and build their relationship with the resident. Now they operated the, the hug machine and shortened the interaction with the resident in order to have the time to wheel the machine back to where it was stored. In each case, existing social and communicative tasks tended to be displaced by new tasks that involved more interaction with the robots rather than the residents and introducing a new distance between care workers and care recipients. Thirdly, um, 
it's important to note that these robots are quite expensive to buy or lease, even with state subsidies, and would be very expensive if scaled up to the level where they could be used with all residents. And ultimately, the manager of Sakura decided that they weren't worth the cost and didn't buy any of the robots at the end of the trial. So what these findings suggest is that the future that care robots would require in order to become a solution to the care crisis would involve firstly employing more uh, but also less skilled care staff who would be paid as little as possible. Um, they would likely also require much larger care facilities um, that could enable economies of scale that could make the costs of robots um, affordable as the need to speak Japanese, uh, possess care training or experience, or to interact with residents could theoretically be significantly reduced, um, then less skilled and lower paid care staff could potentially be brought in more easily from abroad. And in fact, <clears throat> the operationalization of such a vision might already be in the works with the deregulation of migration channels and the accelerating consolidation of Japan's care industry in recent years. Um, I just draw your attention to this source, Eggleston et al. 2021, um, which is a US National Bureau of Economic Research study that analyzed economic data on the use of care robots in Japanese care homes. Um, they found that care homes that adopted care robots employed more people than those with no robots, but this difference was entirely accounted for by non-regular employees. Um, they found that uh, care homes that adopted robots also reduced the monthly wages of nurses um, and that homes with robots were more likely to have hired foreign care workers and have active plans to hire more in the future. Um, so, you know, what this suggests is that in introducing commodified and interchangeable practices of robot care might help render human care labor similarly more commodified and interchangeable, potentially extending existing forms of inequality and precarity, especially in the growing uh, migrant care labor market. And I'll just quote um, roboticist and professor of mm -hmm. Uh, robot ethics, Alan Winfield, on his blog in 2021, talking about the wider application of AI and robots. Quote, the reality is that AI is in fact generating a large number of jobs already. That's the good news. The bad news is that they're mostly, to put it bluntly, crap jobs. We roboticists used to justifiably claim that robots would do jobs that are too dull, dirty and dangerous for humans. But it's now uh, clear that working as human assistants to robots and AIs in the 21st century is dull and both physically and or psychologically dangerous. These humans are required to behave, in fact, as if they are robots. Now, you might possibly be thinking that uh, developing care robots is a harmless enough activity that can quite happily proceed in parallel with other care reforms. But when the state buys into a vision of robot care, um, not only in terms of endorsing and promoting techno-imaginaries of care that fail to recognize the real-life limitations of robots or the reality of what care involves, but also in investing substantial sums of public money in these kinds of robots, then there's a significant risk of diverting funding away from better policy options. Um, and there's also, it also, I think, encourages policymakers to defer making difficult policy choices in the hope that future robots or future AI that doesn't exist yet will, uh, in the words of one Japanese government document on AI, quote, rescue society, unquote, from the problems of the aging population. Um, and in my analysis, I haven't even touched so far on the prospective toxic processes of resource extraction and negative environmental impacts that massively scaling up robotic care across the global north would entail. But thinking about what would potentially be lost in such a trajectory of care roboticization also helped surface what care workers at Sakura saw as important in care. In talking about the friction created in their encounters with robot care, staff also articulated their own views on what was required for good care. Um, and I want to highlight one such element of good care to finish my talk. 
care work is um, frequently referred to the flow or nagare of daily life and work at Sakura, um, a spatial and temporal flow that had its own social caring rhythms of busyness and rel relative calm, times when staff felt, quote, chased by time, as they put it, doing one thing after another, um, and other times when they had time to chat and build relationships with residents. And care staff often use the word yoyu to describe these, these times of um, having the ability to communicate with residents. So yoyu refers to a surplus capacity um, or having plenty of time and space. And care workers often said that yoyu was a necessary prerequisite of good care. As one care worker put it, um, the way of doing care at Sakura is according to time. There's a bunch of set things to do and only a set number of staff. So you're busy with the feeling of how many minutes and how many seconds you have. Um, at the place you used to work, um, there were nine residents um, instead of 80. So we had your you. We could uh, spend time individually talking with them, drinking tea together and so on. Uh, so being able to care while doing those things, that's a big difference. Another care worker said, if you like, you know, next after you do this, you have to do that, then you have to do that, then you have to do this. Then of course, you absolutely can't respond to users' requests. After all, if there aren't enough staff, you can't have care with your you. Um, and just a third quote uh, from another care worker, good care is relaxed, utori care for both staff and residents. If staff are too busy, it's difficult for the residents to make requests. Um, if we have more staff during busy times, then the staff can do things slowly and calm down and could be kind to users who ask for something. And I think that if there's less impatience, that's linked to fewer accidents as well. Um, Yoyu was a capacity or a resource that went beyond the functional minimum requirements of bodily care. Um, it was the capacity not to be chased by time, um, to do one care task after another, but to be able to communicate with residents as individuals, accumulating social interactions over time and developing um, relationships with residents that staff often described as being like family, essentially building kinship with the people they were spending their days with and to whom they were providing intimate care via repeated and reciprocal social interactions, um, including during almost all of the so-called functional care tasks that they did. Um, this individual time spent together in turn provided much of the job satisfaction and motivation for care staff. Um, this repeated accumulation of social interactions and building of uh, social relationships over time via communicative work done by care workers throughout the day, none of that appeared to be thought of as constituting care work in the algorithmic care model of engineers at ICE, um, who would neatly separate out in discrete individual functional and social interactions, but it was seen as essential to good care by staff. The care workers' um, evaluation of the three robots seemed to depend in large part on how their use affected this surplus capacity to provide good care. When robots were perceived to reduce your you, for example, removing opportunities for leisurely communication while wheeling around an operating hug uh, or distancing care staff from residents um, in the ways already described, then uh, workers tended to express negative reactions to the robots and stop using them. Your you um, seemed to represent an ethic of care unbounded by and resistant to the institutionalism of the care home and also resistant to the productivist ideology of wider Japanese capitalism, um, which to some extent was being imported into Sakura via the three care robots and their associated operating processes. Um, and I think that Yoyu suggests a way to move uh, towards more humanistic, caring rhythms that emphasize facilitating social interactions and developing social ties, making care easier for caregivers and care recipients by providing additional time to deliver personal care. This um, solution to the crisis of care is in some ways the most straightforward, but also perhaps the hardest to accomplish under conditions of neoliberal capitalism. 
to acknowledge the skilled work involved in good care, make care a valued job, encourage more caregivers into the sector, resist the imp imposition of an industrialized temporality based on a logic of productivism that we see expressed in algorithmic care and embodied in care robots, and support and make financially and emotionally sustainable the formation of meaningful social relationships between those giving and receiving care. Um, and developing rather than discarding what Shannon Valor calls the moral skills of care. Um, so I just, I know I'm a bit over time, but uh, it's the final slide. This suggests an entirely different approach to care policy than simply developing robots to replace human caregivers. Um, but in terms of, if we're talking about technological innovation of, for care, um, I have a few uh, suggestions. So instead of viewing the resistance of care staff and care recipients as uh, problems of culture or change management that should be ignored or overridden, I think it may be more helpful to go back to the drawing board and start again from different grounding points. Um, firstly, thinking in terms of the socio-technical instead of just the technological. Secondly, striving to gain local understandings of caring and care work as relational practices, um, rather than starting from universalizing assumptions and primarily quantitative analysis. Um, and this is similar to Amy Van Weinsberg's um, proposal for care-centered value-sensitive design that focuses on relationality. Um, and thirdly, centering uh, care um, recipients and care workers and eliciting their active participation across the whole life cycle of any new technology enabled care processes, including research, design, development and ongoing use. So um, I'll leave it there and um, those are my references and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks. Thank you so much, James. Uh, absolutely fascinating talk. Would you like to maybe uh, just close the PowerPoint so that the audience can see you and we can have a you know, Q&A session uh, quickly following that? OK, perfect. So thank you very much. It's really fascinating. I've had like a list of questions. and. Um, but I probably should be brief and just start with one or two. And meanwhile, um, the audience, if you have questions, please type it in the chat box or you can use the raise hand functions. And later when I call on your name, it would be great if you briefly introduce yourself and then um, ask the questions. So if that's OK, I'll ask James just, um, you know, one or two questions to start with. So it's you've it. My impression is that in this talk, you have um, focused mostly on how the care workers think about working with the robots. And although you've mentioned about how the recipients, like the elderly, think about it by using the examples of the robot, teaching them how to do exercise, and they end up feeling quite bored. <laughs> um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the the you know, from the recipient's perspective, what they think about the robots. So in particular, I am interested in this, um, what they think about, whether or not they think having a robot care carers gives them more, makes them feel that they have more dignity as someone who receives care. The reason I ask this is that uh, I come from a family where they are nurses and the nurses told me that even if they enjoy giving care to people, even if they enjoy caring about people, some care work is not pleasant. You know, some care work that they see it as less, is tough work, right? And also from the patient's perspective, um, those intimate moments, for example, you when you need someone to help you go into the bathroom, moments like that you sometimes feel that oh I don't have as much dignity because I'm being seen you know in that particular way so I wonder if you can maybe say a little bit more about from the recipients perspective what they think about receiving cares from the robots especially uh, in relations to this idea of dignity and being ill and you know 
Um, that's my first question. And the second question is you talk about, this is really fascinating. You talk about that the care worker complained about managing the robot, it just, you know, just in, increase their workload. And um, that makes me, that reminds me of, you know, in a sci-fi movie, you often have the robots and the human work as colleagues, you know, they communicate with each other, they come up with solutions. Clearly in your case study and in today's technology, we haven't reached to that point, but since you are in this field, you probably know more about the development of robots. So I wonder if you can maybe say that, will that be the future? Will we have robots as colleagues and have like actually not managing them, not put both of them here and there cleaning them, but actually, you know, more like what we see on in the sci-fi movies. Thank you. So other people, if you have your questions, uh, you can raise your hand. I um, uh, I'll type it in the chat box. So thank you, James. I think you need to unmute yourself. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot for those really, uh, really great and, and very difficult questions. <laughs> so firstly, um, yeah, the view of, um, of residents at Sakura. Um, so here I have to acknowledge um, one of the limitations of the study, which was that um, I was focusing mainly on the care workers. Um, I spoke to care recipients, but um, partly it's it's due to my own um, probably lack of um, adequate um, Japanese language ability, because a lot of the um, residents at Sakura had um, moderate to severe speech difficulties um, or moderate to severe dementia. Um, and I did, you know, struggle to understand what people were saying. Um, I did speak to uh, wh whoever I could of the residents um, and talk to them about their experiences with using the robots. Um, and it was kind of a mixture of different views. Um, as I mentioned, at least one person um, said that they were uh, scared by the robots, um, especially Paro and Pepper, and particularly uh, Pepper. Um, others said, you know, this is great. Um, you know, I've never seen something like this before. Uh, and especially in relation to Pepper, again, Pepper is quite a polarizing kind of uh, robot, I think. Um, but in terms of whether they saw using robots as um, uh, infringing on their sense of dignity, um, I couldn't really give you an answer. And it is something that I do want to um, look at in future research, of course. Um, uh, so, yeah, but I made the decision fairly early on, I think, to, although I was talking to residents as well as care workers, I, I centered the study more on the care worker side. Um, and then the second question about um, working with robots as colleagues. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's this term cobot, which is literally, you know, kind of colleague robot, co-worker co robot. Um, which was originally used for the Baxter robot, which was a kind of um, innovative um, factory type robot that could be easily programmed by um, somebody that wasn't trained in computer science just by moving its arms and showing it what it should do. Um, I think Baxter wasn't particularly successful. It was too expensive and it didn't have the same capabilities as some other advanced industrial robots. And I think they've discontinued it now. Um, Cobot has also been used in the, in the context of care robots in the UK to describe um, Cyberdyne's HAL exoskeleton um, kind of robot, which is one, it's one of these wearable transfer aids. So you, a care worker would um, put it on and um, uh, it, it helps to um, lift or provide lifting support to them. So, um, uh, you know, you can lift uh, a, a resident in this case um, and it won't feel as if you're lifting a heavy weight. Um, those have been described as cobots for the same reason as kind of augmenting um, your physical strength um, in the UK context. Um, 
but I think that's probably not quite what you were talking about in terms of actually collaborating. I mean, it's difficult to know. And I think there's a danger. I mean, um, in the book that I have coming out, I talk about robots being slippery. They're, they're very slippery because as soon as you start talking about what you imagine a robot's, you know, possible uh, functionalities might be in the future, you are on a bit of a slippery slope to sci-fi, um, which can sometimes be useful, but I think it's served as such a huge distraction for so long from the actual capabilities of real robots that are actually being funded and um, you know trying to, to introduce them into care work. So I try to avoid look, speculating about the far future of robots. I mean, what I do know is that the challenges of producing robots, which um, you know, uh, anywhere near what you might consider intelligent, um, uh, are, are very you know, far off, as far as I can tell. I am not a roboticist or a computer scientist, but um, that's what um, my robot roboticist informants have told me at ICE. Thank you very much. I think that's fair enough. Nobody, no one can really predict the future, but I think one of your major contributions from your presentation is that it it, it makes uh, something sound so rosy, you know, more complicated and really thought provoking and make us think deeper about that. So we have a comments or question, uh, a question in the chat box. I'll start with that. And then we have two uh, audience raising their hand. I've seen it and I will call on your name later. So the chat in the chat box, uh, Muhammad asked, is tackling the gendered burden of care at household level key to a better care in the future? Uh, sorry, can you say it again? I haven't um, so Mohammed um, asks, is tackling the gendered burden of care in the household the key to a better care future? So it seems the question's not directly related to uh, the robot and the yeah. elderly care, but maybe you can comment a little bit about the gender aspect of this yeah. whole development. Thank you. Well, I think, um, yeah, I, I agree with that statement. Um, that it's important to tackle the gender burden of care. Um, I think in the case of uh, Japan, historically, as in many other places, um, care work at home has been um, seen as women's work. Um, I think in very recent years that started to change a little bit. Um, there are more male um, carers. Um, I've seen some work, as I mentioned, from Glenda Roberts and uh, Hidoko Costantini talking about um, companies trying to encourage um, workers of both genders to take care leave um, in order that, you know, they have some flexibility so they don't just quit their job suddenly and, um, you know, in order to fulfill uh, caring obligations. Um, as we've, as I've shown, the um, percent, or as I mentioned, the percentage of female labour participation since the introduction of long-term care insurance has increased steadily, um, and partly, I think, as a result of that, um, you know, as this ongoing kind of negotiation of care between um, institutions and families. Um, you know, th those you know, who should do care, um, how they should do care are kind of um, up for grabs a bit more, I think, recently. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's not exactly my, uh, my area of expertise. Um, I guess what I would say is, is sometimes I think care robots are seen as, um, you know, potentially being a liberatory technology that could free, especially women, from those kinds of gendered roles, including at home. I mean, I've, I've focused on robots used in residential elder care, but obviously um, there's also a question of uh, the kinds of robots that might be introduced at home to enable people to you know, live independently or live alone. Um, uh, and yeah, I think there is some expectation that that could um, again, free up women to enter the um, labor force, 
but there are also lots of unintended consequences there, I think. Um, so yeah, it's a good question and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Ray Chan. Hi, James. Um, I really enjoy your talk, particularly you set up the scenes really well, um, talking about uh, how robots interact with the um, care recipient, also the elderly in, in, the, in Japan. I really enjoy. I have a question from a moral perspective, um, particularly the care robots, uh, you give them the autonomy uh, in the sense that it can be do the task by itself or, with, or without human intervention. I'm wondering, uh, a robot without a moral agency, to what to work extent, it will create risk for those vulnerable group like elderly uh, children or some sick people in the medical sex uh, context. From your experience, are there any risks have been created by this type of uh, care robot in your case? Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, I think it depends on which kind. Obviously, there's you know substantially different types of um, robots, um, and they might introduce different types of risks. Um, yeah, and and there's a question uh, whether you're talking about physical risks or moral risks. Um, so the Japanese government quite early on um, tried to, um, so one of the early projects to develop the, the market of care robots was to produce an ISO standard um, that was focused on the physical safety of care robots. Um, and that was seen as a kind of foundation for a future market of care robots, because then you have a kind of global standard. Um, everybody knows, you know, what safe robots should look like. Um, and they actually built um, a big kind of warehouse sized uh, robot safety testing center uh, in Scuba in Japan um, in order to certify care robots to um, this ISO standard, International Standardization Organization standard. Um, so I think their view of risk was purely in terms of physical safety. Um, in terms of physical safety though, uh, despite having this ISO and a, a safety testing center, it's not clear to me that all of those um, risks have been overcome, um, not just in residential care robots, but also in, um, you know, like, like in a residential care home, but also in people's own homes, because if you talk to people who um, care for a relative, um, an older relative, one of the first things they'll say is, you know, you have to make sure that they're not going to trip over anything. <laughs> so probably the most common type of care robot in use in today in Japan are those small kind of pet type robots. Um, but obviously, whenever you have a small robot running around or, you know, moving around on the floor, um, if they can, because you'd have to have a smooth surface, but, um, you know, it introduces trip risks, um, for one, um, that was also the case in the care home. And that was part of the, um, challenge for care workers was you, you couldn't really leave things, leave a robot out, um, because somebody might, um, trip over it. You know, if you left pepper in the corridor, somebody might lean on it. It has a kind of um, inbuilt mechanism to avoid toppling over, but actually it could topple over if you pushed it hard enough. Um, and so, you know, this was part of the struggle of moving the robots out of the way as soon as they were used or constantly having to monitor them from a distance. Um, so I think that there are potential risks. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with robotic, um, you know, like, for instance, in the case of Hug, it is a powerful robotic arm. The thing weighs 65 kilos. I mean, there's, you know, it, it creates, you know, questions, at least, if not physical risks. In terms of moral risks, um, I guess it depends how you're defining those. But um, uh, one of the um, most common 
early critiques of care robots in the sense of social robots was that they potentially deceive the user. Um, so for instance, you know, um, uh, in the case of Palo um, and the, the uh, resident at, at Sakura who became very close to Palo um, to the extent where, you know, she, she was, she wanted to be with it all the time. She would take it back to her room, um, you know, uh, treat it like a baby, talk to it. Um, uh, she'd often cry when she was, was talking to it. Um, you know, it, I'm not sure if that counts as a risk or not, but, um, you know, a risk of disconnection from the rest of, of the, um, uh, the kind of uh, community at the care home. Um, care workers weren't really sure how to deal with that um, or what to think about it. Um, I mean, they were happy in a sense that she had this connection that she hadn't had before, but they were quite disturbed about the implications for, um, you know, how she would relate to other people. Um, how are they going to, what happens when they eventually have to remove Paro? Um, so yeah, I mean, they, they do raise a lot of moral questions, which are probably more than I can get into um, in this session, but thanks for the question. I think Ray asked a really important and also extremely fascinating questions. Um, I think there are two related comments to it. So one is from, I believe it's Francesca, Francesca Bray that we know um, she's not in the room now, but she said in relation to Ray's point on autonomy and risk, there is also the question of responsibility. Where cares are, where care, where car are concerned, for instance, in, for instance, who's responsible if there's an accident and who gets sued? So there's an interesting, um, like there's a law commission that has said about the self-driving car, uh, which Francesca left a link here as well. So that's the first comment in relation to Ray's point. And I mean, I totally got it when when Ray. Uh, raise a question. I think it's maybe I watch I watch too too much sci-fi. <laughs> is that moral agency? You know what you in in the sci-fi you have this villain, uh, villain robot and a good robot and a bad robot, right? And in care work, oftentimes like in the UK, when you enter into care work, you have to do some sort of like enhanced disclosure, right? Which is based on the person's history, and a robot has no history. So like, how how do you do that? And maybe Ray and I are thinking too far ahead that, you know, there's this bad robot, good robot, but it's, I, I think in terms of law and regulation responsibility, these are the things that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it just makes the picture not as rosy and far more complicated um, when it comes to robot and care in the future. Okay, so the next question Can I just is, um, uh, comment quickly on that? Um, sure, because course, it raises yeah. some really, really interesting points. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, for my current project, Path AI, um, I interviewed some um, Japanese law professors. And this question did come up, like who's, who's legally responsible if a care robot causes harm? And what this um, person said was, you know, it's fairly clear in the case of physical harm, you know, um, who would be responsible, you know, if the care robot blows up, for instance, it would be pretty legally, it would be quite clear who's to blame. But he said the more complicated issues are things like, you know, what if an, what if a care robot, a social robot causes some kind of um, mental or emotional harm? I mean, how would you firstly quantify that? How would you prove it? How would you decide who is responsible for that? Um, there's also been a question from uh, a, a different one of my informants who's um, uh, a, an academic at RIKEN, the research institute in Japan, who said, you know, what if, uh, you know, this a social robot is hacked and is then used to um, create a kind of um, emotional loophole into that, that user? You know, what if it asked that user to vote for a particular political candidate or, you know, to buy something, you know, or transfer money or change their will or something like that? I mean, that seems to be a major concern amongst um, some people um, thinking about care robots in Japan. And I think, you know, as the um, technology becomes more complex, it, it raises more and more questions 
I mean, you have all of the issues, the ethical issues that you have for AI, you know, multiplied by additional concerns in the case of robots. Um, and just to, to finish this comment, um, there's also a question about whether robots should, um, should have some kind of rights, not necessarily human rights, but some kind of legal rights in the same way that in America, um, you know, a corporation can be a person, a legal person. Um, some people in Japan especially are saying, well, maybe um, a robot should be a legal person um, in order to allay some legal responsibility or accountability um, in particular situations. So I think, you know, we're just at the very start of thinking about some of these issues. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. So the next question is from Erin Newton. Erin Newton. Yes. Thank you very much, um, James, for a wonderful and fascinating presentation and Loretta for keeping everything together and keeping everybody on track. Um, so my name is Erin Newton. I'm a P, uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Chicago studying care and care work by nurses in Japan. And so uh, that's definitely going to fuel a couple of the questions that I have for you. I apologize, historian speaking to an anthropologist, if some of them were completely off track for you. Um, so first of all, this is maybe more of a simple question to start with. You had a graph in the early part of your presentation showing the growing disparity between the number of people who needed some kind of home care or care in a facility, and then the number of both available and then projected numbers of caregivers to fulfill that need. And so just a very simple basic question that I had was, is it expected that is the ideal scenario for this to be a one on one parity? It is the ideal situation for these things for there to be an equal number of caregivers and an equal number of people who need care so that there is a one on one relationship? Um, mainly because, you know, we can't expect that in classrooms anymore. You know, it's now expected for teachers to be able to divide their attention 30 ways. And, you know, the numbers are not much greater in hospitals or in other places. So I wondered what kind of the expectation of an ideal case was um, for the number of caregivers and those who need care in Japan in the opinions of anybody who's relevant to the case. And the second was, um, I want to kind of come back to this idea of how robotics and gender have kind of intersected in your um, in your case study. So you mentioned that with the introduction of these care robots, there was a number of different sets of tasks that then had to be performed to care for the robots and to make sure that they were used properly, to make sure that you know they were put away, to ensure that nobody got injured, things like that. I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about how that division fell in terms of the gender of the caregivers in the home, whether women ended up doing more types of specific tasks or the male staff ended up doing more kinds of specific tasks. Um, and feel free to tell me that I should just read your dissertation if the answer is kind of long and cumbersome. Um, I apologize. I, I hadn't realized that your dissertation is available yet. So uh, apologies if the questions are completely off base, but thank you. Thanks a lot. Erin, um, those are really good uh, questions. And please don't read my dissertation, just wait until my book comes out <laughs> because uh, yeah, it'll be a better read. Um, All right, deal. Okay, so um, the first question uh, about what is the expected kind of ratio of caregivers to um, care recipients. So obviously I should clarify that I'm talking here specifically about the kind of job that's um, Kaigo Shokuin. So um, caregivers, I guess it's generally translated as um, care staff, not nurses specifically. So talking about care staff, um, there's actually a legal, um, a legally determined ratio within care homes. So I can't remember offhand exactly what it is, but um, uh, you know, at the care home where I was doing my research, there are about 80 residents and about 40 care, care workers. And obviously they alternated across different shifts. Um, but I believe that would be approximately the ratio that's legally, you know, according to the legal criteria. And I believe there's a similar criteria for nurses, you know, how many 
nurses there should be for how many um, care home residents. Um, that was for, um, you know, these Togabetsu, Yorgo, Rojin, Homa. But um, in terms of home care, I'm less certain in the case of Japan. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the um, situation is in terms of, for instance, the length of home care visits um, and things like that. But home care is obviously growing really rapidly and, and the aim is for um, as many people as possible to be living alone in their own house, um, supported by various in-home care services. Um, in terms of robots and gender, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that I saw a huge difference in the way that female and male um, care workers um, did different tasks related to robots. Um, I'd probably, if I was probably generalizing a bit, um, because it's quite a small sample, it's difficult to say whether this is generalizable, but um, male care workers seem to be more interested in the kind of hug type robot. Um, female care workers tended to say that they're interested in the social robots more, and Palo in particular. Um, I guess in terms of a general point that I didn't really make clearly before, um, one implication of, of um, you know, uh, having more migrant care workers coming to Japan and doing this kind of hybridized migrant robot caregiving um, is that, you know, the expectation I think in Japan um, is that many of these migrant care workers will be women. Um, although whether that's actually the case or not uh, is a different question. Obviously, then, you know, this contributes to the issue of the global care chain and, um, uh, you know, creating an underclass essentially of, of um, the poorest paid, um, uh, which is, has both sort of racialized and gendered elements in Japan, I think. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that really answers your questions, to be honest, but... Um, it is difficult to say in, in terms of the care home itself, like how, how tasks were organized in part because it was quite a short time. And, uh, you know, um, care workers kind of gave up on hug very quickly. Um, mm. When it came to Palo, it was a case of giving Palo to, to the person and then observing them from a distance. And that was the same for both uh, male and female care workers. And, um, you know, um, Pepper, similar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so we actually have a lot of questions and I would like to let everyone have the opportunity to ask it. So what I'm going to do next is to ask uh, two people to uh, ask their questions. So we, uh, we collect two questions in one time and then two more questions, which I think would be the end of it. So the next one would be from Gonzalo and then Victor. L Lorette, I can, I can go last. I'm, I'm, I'm fine because oh. I, talked, I, I talked so much already with James that I'm sure that he would appreciate to have comments from other colleagues, yeah? Thank you for your generosity. So the next question would be from Victor and then uh, Caroline, Caroline, Carolina. Thanks, Loretta, and uh, thanks for to James for this wonderful presentation. It's so amazing. Um, I'm actually a research fellow at NTU Singapore, uh, looking at the intersections of disability and emerging technology. And I'm kind of um, fascinated by sort of the kind of range of robots that you show. Uh, so ranging from sort of the very menial kind of robots that do weightlifting kind of stuff towards the, in a, in a sense, the more intelligent kind of robots. And I wonder if you could share more about um, the question of bias in AI with regards to this kind of robots that are you know, highly intelligent? Are there certain biases in the way in which care is conceptualized within the AI, the workings, the internal workings of such robots? Yeah, just a very general comment. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, yes, the next one, if Carolina, you can ask. Uh, Only uh, Rodriguez is fine, please. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm an under, undergraduate from University of Coimbra and I'm getting interested in human-machine interactions. Um, 
how are the reactions, if you are aware of them, of the developers when they receive this feedback of, oh, this isn't being efficient, oh, this isn't uh, doing the things that you would like that you would like to solve, this isn't solving the problem. How do the developers usually react to that, or, or in this situation, how did they actually react? Okay, thanks. Um, maybe I'll, I'll answer. Um, Rodriguez's this question first. Um, yeah, it's, it's strange, actually. I, ha I have presented this work back to um, colleagues at um, IST. Um, and I mean, you know, I don't want it to seem like uh, um, I'm impugning their motives at all, because I think that the engineers that I was, um, that were um, my informants there, you know, they, they had the best intentions. Um, and they wanted to help people. Um, so, you know, it's not like I'm I'm also attacking their, you know, attacking them in any way, really. It's it's talking about specifically, you know, what the, the actual implementation of these types of robots would look like in reality. Um, uh, but, and possibly this reflects the, the culture of um, engineering circles in Japan. Um, but, uh, you know, they accepted it, you know, with a lot of politeness and uh, no questions. <laughs> so, yeah, it's difficult to, to tell what the um, reaction is. But, you know, the project is still, um, there's a kind of follow on project, the project that I was working on, and it, it continues in the same vein. Um, and Victor's question about bias, um, I think it, kind of depends exactly what you're talking about in terms of bias. Um, I mean, I think I've kind of explained how, you know, a bias in terms of um, thinking in, of care in an algorithmic sense, as, you know, um, care is this kind of broken up into different um, chunks and can be done, um, can be reproduced by robots. I mean, that represents a kind of bias in the way that, you um, roboticists, I think, think about work and maybe reflects their own, the way they work themselves. Um, and then potentially they're uh, viewing care through the same lens. Um, if you're talking about biases that are based into machine learning systems, as they're talked about, you know, I mean, so machine learning for anyone who isn't familiar, um, uh, you know, aims to find patterns in data using advanced statistical techniques. Um, you know, the short answer, I suppose, is I'm not really sure um, when it comes to, I mean, so Hug doesn't use AI. Um, uh, Paro apparently does use AI, although it's a bit unclear. It, it's difficult to tell because it has such a limited range of movements and actions that it can do. But in theory, it can learn its users and it can learn things like um, when it's called a certain name, uh, it learns its new name and then it reacts to the new name. Um, I don't think those, again, it depends on your definition of bias, but it's not straightforward to me how that would be biased or what the impact would be. In terms of Pepper, um, which probably used the most you know, AI in terms of machine learning. Um, you know, for instance, it had uh, voice rec or speech recognition, which didn't really work. Um, it was used in very specific ways. So only a couple of apps were used. Um, one was a kind of um, quiz app um, where it would ask a question and the resident would answer the question. But the problem was that it used speech recognition, which doesn't work in a care home where there's a lot of voices and lots of background noise. So essentially that didn't, it, um, that didn't really work. I mean, if you're talking about speech recognition, you could potentially talk about biases in, for instance, accents or types of voices. Um, so for instance, older people often you know, like the people at Sakura, a lot of them had some kind of um, speech difficulty, um, which it wouldn't be able to recognize, or um, spoke using a certain form of Japanese that's more informal or curtailed, which again, it, the, it wouldn't understand. 
Um, so there are these potentials, but I think with you know this is in the future still. Um, when I think about those kinds of biases, I think more in terms of probably the most advanced AI applications that are used by consumers, which are things like voice control, virtual assistants like Alexa. Um, but I, I've looked at Alexa for another study, but it's probably, um, yeah, um, uh, not in terms of this study and in terms of the robot project. So yeah, the short answer is that I think, you know, bias in AI, AI was less of an issue in the way that we think about like gender, uh, race, sex bias um, in wider applications of machine learning. But in terms of bias in, in the way that engineers thought about things and how they encoded that into their systems, then absolutely there was bias. Thanks, James. Okay, so uh, we have the last two questions before the end of this seminar. Um, the first one is from Steviana, and then is Gonzalo. Thank you. Hi, James. Um, so I just wanted to ask a brief question uh, for everybody. My name is Steviana Desai. I'm from the University of Sheffield, and I'm running a project called Imagining Robotic Care. Um, I was looking at the population of the particular care home that you were embedded in and wondering the extent to which that was mediating the staff reactions to the usefulness of the robots, because they do appear to be the kind of vision that we normally get of the very passive, very frail elderly. And I'm wondering if there might be a difference if it was a different group of people, if they were more able to interact with the robot themselves. Um, yeah, and thanks. Gonzalo, would you like to add your question or just uh, wait to the end? You need to unmute. Uh, James, would you like to respond to Stevia? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we've we've uh, talked by email, but it's nice to see you and uh, your cat as well. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think it, it could have been different with a different group of um, of older people. Um, I guess the focus of my presentation, my project more widely uh, is, you know, it's aimed at, at this particular care home because it was very representative of the, that type of care facility, which is the most common type of care facility in Japan. Um, part of the, um, the issue in Japan is that the, uh, so under long-term care insurance system, they kind of grade the care level uh, or the care need of um, different older people. And they use that care level to determine legally who is allowed to go to a residential elder care facility. Um, and it also determines the subsidies that those elder care facilities receive based on the number of residents and what their average level of care need is. is. Um, so I think that the premise of this talk um, you know, is looking at the robotic solution for particular, you know, so-called problems. Um, it's very much focused on this group of people with this level of care need. So, um, uh, you know, that, that is the, the kind of crisis of care is, I think, seen by, um, you know, the Japanese government as a crisis of care at this level. Um, if we're talking about other older people who perhaps have a lower care need, yeah, I mean, it, it could be, it could be different. Um, uh, that would be a different, a different research project, I guess, but one that I'm very interested in as well. Um, I'm also, you know, in a, a project after my PhD, I was looking at, um, different digital care technologies in the UK and not just robots because robots aren't used very much in the UK. But, um, you know, looking at things like, you know, Alexa and the potential for Alexa to replace elements of telecare um, mm. in the home with people who perhaps are more able. Um, but, you know, those, those kind of bring up all sorts of other questions about, um, you know, the digital divide, whether people are being institutionalized in their own home, um, mm. issues of uh, privacy, issues of um, potentially uh you know local government starved of funds turning to huge global you know technology corporations to solve the problems 
mm. using precarious corporate infrastructures and requiring certain you know um, digital infrastructures and support so you know if we're talking about a different group of older people potentially not in care homes potentially in their own homes using slightly different technologies um i think it would be a different uh, a different question and seeing your cat makes me think about um the kind of pet robots which are by far the most popular types of uh, robots yeah. the latest one is called qb and it's um a kind of fluffy robot uh -huh. that's just a torso and a tail that wags like a cat's tail um <laughs> you want to be replaced by a robot <laughs> Yeah, but I think a uh, cat robot, what I would miss is the smell, you know, like you can't really replicate it. Right? Yeah. Um, okay, so the last question, uh, Gonzalo, I guess you have to be quick. Thank okay, you. can I ask a very quick question then? Yes. Uh, James, thank you for your talk. It's really fascinating. I mean, your work is really uh, fascinating in many, in many different ways. I particularly enjoyed in this presentation the way you brought in the issue of yo-yo or yo-yo yeah in, in in mandarin it should be you you yeah in the spare time and i'm i'm i particularly enjoyed it because i'm reading a cantonese cartoon um entitled in in english the philosophy of laziness and 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 part of the part of the of the ethical message of the cartoon has to has to do precisely uh with the idea of spare time and having ample time as a critique, of course, of neoliberal capitalist um, overwork culture, which is particularly uh, salient, of course, in Japan. I mean, um, this is the country of overwork as much as it is the country of care robots. Um, and I'm, and I was kind of thinking about, you know, to what extent can this yo-yo ethics be? you know, scaled up in the same way that robots can be scaled up. I mean, uh, is there a potential for scaling up an ethics of yo-yo as some kind of critique to this uh, high-tech uh, capitalist, um, you know, um, culture, right? You know, and I wonder if in Japan um, there are people articulating ideas uh, as such. I mean, so that's that's one one question related to this very quick is the question of um, the carbon footprint of these robots, which seems to me incredibly important because, you know, as you know, part of the environmental critique of capitalism is also about, you know, changing um, labor structures uh, in, in, in such a way that you are allowing for degrowth. I mean, we need degrowth as opposed to uh, to more production as opposed to more profit. So um, what is exactly the carbon footprint of these robots? You can take this as a comment. You don't have to uh, to answer. But I would like to hear your answer on the first question. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I should just mention um, there's a really good book by Kate Crawford called Atlas of AI, which tackles some of these questions. Yeah. But in the, in the case of um, robots, you have you know, non-recyclable um, lithium ion batteries, which use um, lithium, which um, is being extracted in incredibly toxic processes in places like Mongolia. Um, you, you require rare earths, uh, cobalt, um, you know, for AI applications or the cloud, you need these data centers, which, uh, you know, create various um, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. So, yeah, I can tell you offhand the carbon footprint, but it, it you know, if it was scaled up, it would be huge. Yes. And, you know, five years down the line, because these aren't made to last for 20 years, you end up with mountains of e-waste as a result of these kinds of robots. Um, yeah, you know, you, I, I have thought recently about how it could be scaled up, you know, or what that would look like. Um, yeah, and it's something that I do want to, to develop more. Um, one of the interesting things was that when I talked to care workers, they generally really enjoyed their job. I mean, the thing that they enjoyed, um, a lot of them were older. I think the average age was 44. And especially the men some of the, the uh, male care workers, they said, you know, I used to have this corporate job. And then, you know, there was some, you know, they'd say euphemistically, there was some kind of difficulty at work. 
Um, and uh, I didn't know what to do. You know, I was, I was 55 or whatever. I couldn't move to another corporate job. Um, or others said, you know, um, I was working in a, an auto parts factory or something. Um, and then I got laid off and I wasn't sure what to do. And then they went to, you know, a career center um, or, you know, in the case of older workers, Hello Work, which is set up an, an agent, government agency that's set up to place people in uh, other jobs. And, you know, they were told, you know, why don't you apply for a care job? And, you know, they, they, they weren't sure initially, like, is care really for me? But they found that when they entered this work and started to, you know, talk to people and their job was, full of, you know, basic, based on communication, um, they really enjoyed it and they enjoyed the fact that a it's pretty much you know um, because of the labor shortage in care work you're never gonna have problems finding work even though it's very low paid but also they had you know they had these opportunities to kind of socialize during their work and they really enjoyed it and I think that's part of this idea of your you getting away from this overwork culture you know taking time like you said um, absolutely. So, um, yeah, um, I don't, I don't think it would be fair to call it laziness, but, you know, having more time and, you know, the thing that it makes me think as well is that, um, there, there are a group of people in Japan that, um, you know, enjoy this kind of your you, and I think it's retired people. Um, so perhaps, you know, there is, um, there is, a way to expand that because obviously that group of people is expanding as well um but yeah i, I need to work more on that but thanks for the, for the suggestion okay thank you very much thank you james for this wonderful fascinating thought-provoking talk and thank you all the input and all the questions uh i i think it's one of the seminars that you know uh attract so many questions in a while um, before we end, we are already nearly 10 minutes over time, but before we end, I have uh, two announcements to make. The first one is, um, so we, uh, if you have work, if you're working on science, technology and society in or beyond Asia, and if you would like to share your work with us, then you're very welcome to uh, get in touch with us and we can uh, try to, you know, create something. And you can find our contact details on Scientech Asia or in oneword.org. And our next seminar, uh, we will have a break for Chinese New Year. And our next seminar, I think is on the 3rd of March. And it's by uh, Chitra for Katari by me. And it's about maps and cartograph cartography, pardon me. Um, so that's us um, tonight. Thank you very much, James. I hope you also enjoy the, you know, the conversations and everyone else. Have a good evening and have a good day. Thank and you. And happy new year. Gong hei yeah, Gong hei fa choi. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, Loretta. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for their comments and questions.